you know that less than 9% of plastic can be recycled? The rest ends up in landfills, incineration, or it's even in the food that we eat. Now, plastics, they're everywhere. They're not only on the clothes that we're wearing, but they're also inside our body in the form of microplastics that can lead to respiratory diseases and even cause cancer. And this happens because we simply cannot recycle. Our current technology is not strong enough to deal with these complex waste streams. Therefore, that plastic bottle that you put in a recycling bin, sorry to tell you, but most likely it will end up in a landfill. Now, even if it's possible to be recycled, the product has a lower grade than the initial one, which basically means that you cannot recycle that again. Now, what if we could change this? And this is where I come with the research that I've pioneered called fast hydrolysis. With this fast hydrolysis, we are able to completely decompose bottles in less than three minutes just by using water. We are able to get the building blocks with high enough purity to be able to be repolymerized over and over again. So plastic doesn't end up in the waste. Now we are able to target the specific conditions to be able to decompose other types of plastics, which means that now we can deal with complex waste streams. And so far, this is the most sustainable process to date, even when we compare with other, uh, other processes. Now with fast hydrolysis, we developed a complex kinetic model and a machine learning regressor where we are able to find the most optimal conditions for the production of the, yield, the products that we want with our maximum yields. So in the two minutes that I've been talking, we could have decomposed thousands and thousands of bottles. But right now, plastic is not a, re a burden, it's a resource. Thank you. Please raise your hand if you guys went out to see any part of the eclipse a few weeks ago. This is an event that really exemplifies how space can capture our collective, our collective imagination and perhaps even spark a desire for exploration to learn more about phenomena such as this. NASA is, or, is an organization that champions space exploration and through their Artemis program are looking to go back to the moon and build a long-term and sustainable human presence there with the intention of forging further into our solar system and learning more about it in the process. However, a roadblock to reaching the moon is the cost. It's an estimated one to three million dollars to send a single kilogram of payload and land it on the moon. This is only about two boxes of pasta, and if I wanted to send Ted here to the moon, he would cost 15 million dollars. So in order to build a long-term presence on the moon and keep it running, we need to bring those costs down. And a way to do this is by using as many local lunar resources as possible. And an area that really benefits from this is propulsion. So my research focuses on developing a propulsion system that one, can utilize as many, can utilize an energy source already proposed for use on the moon, and two, employ a propellant that can be found locally, which in our case is water. So instead of using traditional chemical combustion, we use an external energy source in the form of microwaves to generate a plasma from water vapor. This plasma then heats the remaining propellant and generates thrust in this way. So not only can beamed energy propulsion leverage existing lunar infrastructure, we can also eliminate the cost that comes from sending additional propellant to space by using water extracted from lunar ice for a propellant. This can save millions if not billions of dollars and take us one step forward to being a deep space faring society. And I'll leave you a quote with, I'll leave you with a quote from Carl Sagan. He said, we have lo lingered long enough on the shores of the cosmic ocean. We are ready at last to set sail for the stars. Thank you. Last year, driving to work in the US consumed 369 million gallons of gasoline and emitted 2.8 million metric tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every day. Not only are we going to run out of fossil fuels in the next 100 years, but we are hurtling towards a climate crisis. So we need better materials and sustainable materials that can solve this issue. One of the technologies that we have is breaking water into hydrogen, but this process is very expensive and cannot be scaled up economically. This is where my research comes in. I provide a synthetic framework for designing alternative materials to combat this issue. Right now, we are um, restricted by the elements that are available in the periodic table. Um, 
But if you take any two combination of elements, the outcome of products is six. You can have individual outcomes. You can have things that are tied up together, solid solutions or alloys or core shell structures. Expanding that to say five element combination, there are hundreds of possibilities. And each of these products have their own unique properties. So if you're looking for a specific material with a specific property, you have to go fishing. This is where my research comes into play. I explored the whole space of chemical reactivity, thermodynamics, reaction parameters to identify the optimum reaction conditions to give you the product of your desired outcome and composition while eliminating all other possibilities. So if you want a specific product with a specific composition, my design guidelines helps you to eliminate all these possibilities so that you do not have to triage through all combinations and thus, my methodology can also be expanded to other classes of materials such as alloys, oxides, and calcogenides. And together with this um, impact, we can explore the next generation of sustainable materials for a better future. Thank you. In the last 24 hours, more than 200 people have lost their lives to alcohol abuse. And it's not just the health consequences that are devastating. It costs us more than $200 billion annually so what do we do about this? The World Health Organization has urged the brewing industry to replace alcoholic beer with its non-alcoholic counterparts. Currently, this entails removing ethanol using this very expensive device called a de-alcoholizer. And this, however, also removes the key flavors that make beer taste like beer making the consumers very unhappy. Barley used in brewing consists of 80% maltose and 20% glucose. Yeast can normally use this maltose to produce 5% ethanol. Scientists thought if they used a non-saccharomyces yeast that cannot use this 80% maltose, it would only produce 0.5% ethanol. Great, but there's a problem there's still that 80% maltose in the final beer, making it taste super sweet. My research uses an enzyme to reduce the maltose to just 20% so that the non-saccharomyces yeast can use the glucose to produce 0.5% ethanol and also produce flavors that mimic that of beer, such as apple or banana. And this cheap and easy method will help reduce al alcoholic beer sales by a hundred a thousand ounces in just a week, changing the trajectory of alcohol abuse. Thank you. Uh, I don't bother you guys. I mean, later this afternoon, the temperature will be high 70s. It's pretty hot for me. Don't know about you guys, but anyway, I want to tell you, 10 years ago, it was definitely not as hot as right now. As demonstrated here, the global warming is causing a lot of issues, and that's one of the biggest challenges human race is facing. If we don't want to boil you to death in the next 10, 20 years, we're going to think about how we're going to deal with this problem. One of the solutions is transitioning into renewable energy. The problem is, renewable energy requires energy storage device, and lithium, demonstrated right there, is one of the critical components for making those energy storage devices. With that being said, an effective and green lithium production method is critical for human race transitioning into renewable energy era and, uh, and curbing the global warming problem. However, there are currently there are a lot of problems with lithium production right now. Number one, uh, extensive water usage, which caused the environmental damage. Number two, use organic solvent that are toxic, carcinogenic, and not good for recycling. Number three, the current process requires high energy input, which further contribute to global warming. Here comes us. We try to separate lithium and make lithium production feasible in the aqueous phase using specialized material. We can do three things. Number one, reduce water usage. Number two, totally eliminate organic solvent. In that fashion, we can make the process more green. Number three, we can make our process under room temperature, which make the, everything more effective. So we further can fine tune our material to make it more selective, which means it can filter out more impurities, make the whole process more effective. By doing this, we can help uh, establish an effective and green lithium production method which can, help, uh, which can help human race usher into the renewable energy era and curb global warming. Thank you.